is our first video in the ecology series and in this first video we're going to look at the species of uh, species communities and ecosystems and ecology is really looking at the study of, of living things and how they interact with other living things or with the non-living components of their environment and so over the course of this unit and specifically this video we'll begin to introduce the different parts of the environment and how we classify different parts of the environment and then other videos of this unit will look at some of the different characteristics of ways that organisms interact with their environments. Um, the first thing that we want to do is distinguish the difference between what is considered living and that is biotic. Biotic means the living component uh, or parts of an ecosystem. Abiotic then is anything that's non-living. So this would include the physical uh, characteristics of an environment that are non-living such as uh, temperature, um, maybe if it's a, a marine environment, uh, the salinity, the pH, um, the amount of rainfall, any non-living component of an ecosystem or an environment would be considered abiotic. So within an environment there are obviously different groups of organisms that live within an ecosystem, within an environment, and species is what we call those. And a species is a group of individuals of common ancestry that are closely uh, in resemblance to one another and have the ability to reproduce and this is the really important part the ability to reproduce and have fertile reproducing offspring if organisms can reproduce and have an offspring that's great but if those offspring aren't able to reproduce that species can't continue and so a species must be able to reproduce with one another one another and have reproducing fertile offspring when members of the same species are, are together in the same area, we call this a population, and that is all living things in the same, of the same species in a habitat at any one time that at least have the chance of interbreeding. We refer to this as a population. Now populations can sometimes um, be limited in their ability to reproduce. And a good example of this would be if we have two populations of the same species but they're in different areas they're probably unlikely to reproduce with one another because they are in two separate locations. For example, if the species that we're looking at is small and is unable to cross large rivers um, such as the Columbia River, uh, those two species would be, or those two groups, excuse me, would be geographically isolated from one another and they're probably not going to be able to reproduce. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are different species because they could potentially interbreed. It just means that they're separated or reproductively isolated from one another. Generally, for two groups to be considered the same species, they need to be able to interbreed and have reproducing offspring. And until they can't have fertile offspring, then they would be considered the same species. A community, then, is building upon a population. And a community is all the living things in a habitat or an ecosystem. You can have multiple communities in a habitat at any one time. So this would be like the insects and the plants and the birds and the animals. All of that together makes up the community. If you then take that one step further, an ecosystem is a unit of nature that has all of the living things, the communities and populations and different species, interacting with one another, as well as the physical and the chemical environment. That would be the abiotic. So the ecosystem is the combination of the biotic, all of the living things, as well as the abiotic, all of the non-living things together in one area, and is really looking at how all of those things interact with one another. In looking at describing species a little bit more closely, we can call some species autotrophs. And these are organisms that can synthesize their own organic molecules from inorganic substances. Plants, photosynthetic bacteria, algae, these are all organisms that we would call autotrophs because they're able to make their own uh, organic material or most times sugar. Um, there are some organisms that are able to actually feed themselves autotrophically and heterotrophically, meaning they, they have to acquire so they can consume energy and they can they have to acquire it some, some way. And so a heterotroph is the opposite of an autotroph. Uh, and this would be organisms that have to get their or organic molecules, oftentimes sugar, uh, from other organisms. And these would be generally referred to as consumers. And you can have different levels of consumers, primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. And so you and I would be examples of consumers. Uh, animals would be good examples of consumers, birds, etc. Most organisms that we think of are oftentimes consumers. So to recap that, consumer is an organism that ingests other organic material um, that is living 
or has been recently killed. Um, to break this down a little bit further, uh, besides just consumers, we also have herbivores um, that solely eat plants. So an herbivore is just eating plant material. Carnivores are secondary consumers or above, and they only eat meat. Omnivores, most oftentimes humans, eat both. Um, and so depending on what an organism eats, we can apply some of these different labels to it. Detrivores are organisms that ingest dead organic matter. And they would be considered a type of heterotroph, and they are breaking down and ingesting that organic matter internally. That is a detrivore. And a good example of this would be an earthworm. They take in um, soil particles and they help to recycle the nutrients within the soil, and they're taking in that dead organic matter and using that as, their, uh, as an energy source that's requiring energy. The opposite well, maybe not the opposite, but very similar to that is something called a sapotroph. And these are organisms that live on or in dead organic matter. And similar to the detrivore, they are consuming waste or, or dead waste. But rather than doing that internally, they're doing it externally. So what they do is they secrete digestive enzymes into whatever it is that they're digesting and then absorb the products of the digestion. And these are also examples of heterotrophs. Um, mushrooms and fungi would be a great example of a sapotroph. Inorganic nutrients would include carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, nitrogen and phosphorus obtained from inorganic nutrient cycling in the environment. Um, we need carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, those elements are necessary and needed to be able to make sugar. Nitrogen and phosphorus are necessary for uh, making sugar as well as amino acids and DNA. Consumers obtain carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, through the different cycles of these elements. Um, and those are consumed by feeding relationships. So by consumer eating something else is how they're going to be able to obtain nitrogen or phosphorus or, or, or carbon for that matter. And we'll take a look at feeding relationships and energy transfer in our next video. Nutrient cycling helps to maintain the supply of, organic, of inorganic nutrients. So these inorganic nutrients are not being created or destroyed, they're just simply being recycled. A sustainable ecosystem, speaking of that, is something that can be continued indefinitely, would be sustainable. Unfortunately, our use of many resources is not really sub sustainable. Um, nutrients can be, as I said, can be recycled indefinitely. Energy is often provided by the sun. Uh, and there's three types of sustainable ecosystems that you could think of. Uh, or, or three requirements, excuse me, of sustainable ecosystem. This would be nutrient availability, detoxification of waste products, and energy availability. And this picture right here represents an ecosphere. And this is an enclosed glass container that contains algae, various bacteria, and shrimp, um, and water, obviously, that, that creates an enclosed environment or ecosystem. And so the shrimp eat the algae. The waste of the shrimp provides um, ammonia. Uh, for the bacteria in the ecosphere to be able to break down into nitrates and nitrites that the algae then uses along with photosynthesis in order to be able to grow. So it's this complete enclosed ecosystem um, where everything is self-sustaining. That's our video um, for looking at communities, species, and ecosystems. In the next one, we'll take a look uh, a little bit more closely at the transfer of energy and how feeding relationships result in the transfer of both organic and inorganic elements and compounds.